Transformers and self-supervised learning. How well do they go hand in hand? Some people love the Transformer architecture and welcome it into the computer vision domain. Others don't want to accept that there's a new kid on the playground. Let's have a look at what happens when you build on Biol's idea of self-distillation in self-supervised learning and plug in a vision transformer. That is what the authors at Facebook AI Research asked themselves when working on the first Dino paper. Are there any emerging properties when combining both? Well, one cool effect of using transformers is the ability to look at the model's self-attention maps. That is what we see here in this teaser image. We can visualize the self-attention map of the class token in the final layer and pretty much see that the model learns to recognize the main object in the image. The model pretty much learns a segmentation map without any labels. I think this is really cool. When predicting the final representation of this image right here, the model pays the most attention to the bird. When doing so for this image right here, it pays attention to the boat and so on. This boat example could be especially tricky when learning in a supervised fashion, since that model is more inclined to learn shortcuts, like as paying attention to the water, because water and a metal object mean boat. We can very nicely see this effect when looking at this video right here. The above case is the attention map when training in a self-supervised fashion and the right visualization showcases the fully supervised approach. We can see that in the supervised case, the attention map is noisier and doesn't only look at the main object, the dog, but also the surrounding. But before we continue with the cool findings, let's have a look at how they actually achieved this. This is the training pipeline, which is also part of the self-distillation family. We can directly see its resemblance and differences to the Biol paper. We once again have our original source image, apply two different sets of random augmentations and end up with two different views. We again have our online network, which is now called the student network, and our target, now called the teacher network, which once again is an exponential moving average of the student network. From here on, things start to look different. We have no further projection layer, nor a prediction head. If there is no prediction head, how do we prevent, or rather reduce the likelihood, of representation collapse? Well, first of all, we have this centering right here, which can be seen as simply adding a bias C to the teacher predictions. This bias uses batch statistics to compute the mean of the batch and is updated similarly to the exponential moving average. This hyperparameter M is pretty much the same as the tau parameter in the EMA equation. We update this bias parameter C slightly with every batch. This centering is probably the main operation to avoid collapse to a constant function. Centering prevents one dimension to dominate as kind of a pseudo label, but also encourages collapse to the uniform distribution. That is why it also somewhat relies on this sharpened softmax since it has the opposite effect. Imagine you have a bunch of pictures and you want to teach the model to recognize different objects in those pictures. Now, if the model always looks at the same object because it gets its attention the most, like a cute dog, the model will only learn about dogs and nothing else. Centering is like trying to be fair and making sure that the AI learns about all the different objects equally. It's like saying, okay, let's divide the pictures into different groups and each group should be looked at equally. This way the model will learn about different objects in a balanced way. The model is encouraged to learn about a variety of classes and features rather than focusing on a single dominant class. Sharpening, on the other hand, is a technique used to make sure that when wanting to classify an object, the model doesn't get confused and always picks different objects randomly. In other words, always predicts a uniform distribution. It's like making sure that each time the model does tend to pick an object, it's confident and sure about its choice. And why is there this cross entropy and not the mean square error like in Biol? The mean square error surprisingly does work with Dino, but cross entropy simply seems to work better. Dino also works when adding a further prediction head to the student network. 
But that doesn't seem to help much either. <laughs> in fact, we don't even necessarily need the softmax operation if we use the mean square error loss. But if we use cross entropy, we obviously do because that loss is defined over probability distributions, which again seems to work better. Okay, that was a lot to unpack and somewhat build intuition. But this hopefully shows you how much experimentation is done to see what empirically works and what doesn't. What also seems to work better is not simply using the cross entropy over all different view embeddings, but using a very specific setup. Let's see what this actually means and return to our little friendly quokka. Let's again generate multiple views. This time, let's say four. Change their color slightly and crop and resize. Now, when cropping, we want to specifically have two cases. Crops that contain 50% or more of the original image and crops with smaller cutouts. These large crops are called global crops. When assigning our views to the two branches, for the teacher, we specifically want to use only our global views. And for the student, we'll use all views. In other words, the local and global cropouts. What we're now comparing is the teacher embedding of one of the global crops and all the embeddings of all the samples from the student network, except for the embedding of the same global view. We can now compute the cross entropy of each student embedding with this one teacher embedding and repeat this whole process. And voila, we have our weird looking cross entropy loss that enforces local to global correspondence. We already talked about the two cropping cases in the Simplier video, where we have two adjacent views and the here enforced case of local and global views. Apparently the model learns better when learning to look at smaller parts of a bigger object and when trying to match it to the embedding of a model that has more information at hand. Makes sense to me, as long as the teacher produces better embeddings than the student. This is also an assumption made in the Biol paper, but since the authors here went ham on experiments, ablation studies and the quest of building intuition, they actually verified this assumption by looking at the accuracy of both the student and teacher networks during training. The teacher does appear to be smarter than the student, and whenever the student improves, the teacher does so as well since it is a more stable version of the student. Keyword exponential moving average. All that up to a certain point where the teacher doesn't have anything to teach anymore and both converge. How relatable. But okay, cool. We just looked at the novel and improved self-distillation framework that once again is agnostic of the architecture. So where are the transformers and why are they specifically so special with this framework? Let's simply look at a comparison between different self-supervised learning frameworks and plug in the classic ResNet and a vision transformer. When looking at the validation accuracy of the trained ResNets, we can see that the Dino framework yields the best performance but can rather be considered on par with the other baseline approaches. However, when replacing the ResNet architecture with a vision transformer, Dino unleashes its potential and outperforms other baselines significantly. Especially in the case of KNU's neighbor classification. KNN is one of the standard evaluation protocols for self-supervised learning in today's time, but wasn't back then when Simplia and Biol were developed and published. Ugh back then, as if that wasn't like two to three years ago. Knews neighbor. Why is it so cool and how does it work? You don't need any fine tuning. We still need labels, obviously, but we now simply project all our labels data into our representation space to generate our class clusters. When wanting to classify a new data point, for example, an image, we pass it through our neural network and project it into representation space. We then simply count the k nearest neighbors, in this case three, and do a majority vote. In this case, most of our neighbors are of class orange. So the new image is also classified as class orange. This k is a new hyperparameter, as if there weren't already enough. And in the paper, it is found to yield the best results when set to 11. Okay, cool. Here is a table with super exciting results. Dino, of course, is the best when looking only at ResNets, only at VATs, 
and across different architectures. But when looking at same size architectures, it's still not beating a fully supervised model. Cool, but even cooler is again looking under the hood and visualizing the attention maps. When looking at those from the top three attention heads, we can see impressive properties. Similar to CNNs, where each kernel is responsible for extracting certain features, we can see that different attention heads pay attention to different semantic regions of an image. Here, for example, one head pays attention to the clock face, one to the flag, and one to the tower itself. Or here, we can again see how one focuses on the collar, one on the head, and one on the white neck of the zebra. Isn't that so cool? All of this is learned without any labels, without any specific segmentation maps. In fact, we could simply interpret one attention map as a segmentation output and compare supervised and self-supervised training using Dino. As already mentioned, when training in a self-supervised fashion, the model learns to focus more on the main object in the image than when training a network specifically for classification. The learning signal is stronger in the case of self-supervised learning. In classification, the model can learn to use shortcuts to solve its task. When trying to match the image of this bird to the bird class, the model can use the sky as an important feature or the branches. In the end, if the classification accuracy, or rather loss that is optimized, is satisfied, the model doesn't really care whether it actually only looked at the bird or its surroundings. In self-supervised training, on the other hand, we don't really have such a simple and straightforward optimization task. The model needs to learn to match color augmented local views to global views. It has to learn to produce embeddings while ignoring all augmentations applied to the original source image. The features it needs to learn to extract are much more specific. I hope this all makes sense, even though your brain might be somewhat overwhelmed with all this information. Especially if you have just watched my previous videos on self-supervised learning. I mean, my brain was fried after doing all of this research. And I probably didn't even get all the details. Self-supervised learning is really cool, powerful and interesting. But all of this was just scratching the surface. Further advancements, for example masked image modeling, were used by the follow-up papers to Dino, iBot and Dino V2. The learned representations can be used for so many different downstream tasks. The training and architecture improvements of Dino V2 over iBot is a list of many small tuned knobs like the right patch size, teacher momentum, a better centering algorithm and so on. Also, Dino V2 developed a very sophisticated data preprocessing pipeline to generate a much larger but curated dataset. Self-supervised learning remains a daunting field with a mind-boggling array of methods, each with intricate implementations. That's why MetaAI recently published a 70-page long cookbook to help navigate through this field. So if you are interested in this topic, and since you are still watching at this point, you probably are, I can highly recommend you to have a look at the publication. It is a lot, but a very good read. And I hope this little series will have helped you to get a fundamental understanding that will also aid you in navigating the cookbook. If so, I would appreciate a like to tell the YouTube recommender system that this video might also be useful to other people. And for more content that hopefully helps you navigate the world of AI, don't forget to subscribe. Bye.